what's up hello my name is Emma and today I'm going to be talking about more of my recent reads 2020 has not been the hottest reading year for me with the pandemic and school it has just been difficult for me to keep a consistent reading schedule today I'm going to be talking about nine books that I've recently read in the past couple of months and then I actually have quite a few more books that I've read that I'm just cutting off of this video for time's sake and I'll be talking about them in a recent reads number four very soon. But before I start talking about all of the books that I've recently read and what my thoughts on them were, I am super excited to talk about today's video sponsor which is Function of Beauty. Function of Beauty is a 100% vegan and cruelty-free customizable hair care brand that is made specifically for you. You fill out a quick two-minute online quiz to express your hair type and your hair goals, and then personalized products will be sent directly to your door. Historically, I have only ever really bought hair care products from like the grocery store and pharmacies, so it's been a cool change to go to Function of Beauty where you can pretty much pick everything about your product from what it does to even the color, scent, and fragrance level. You get your name printed on every bottle so you know it's 100% for you and every package even comes with a cute page of stickers. I've been using my own personal formula for their shampoo and their conditioner as well as their body wash and body lotion and even their hair mask. I have been using Function of Beauty for a couple of weeks now and honestly I have like never been more obsessed with personal care products. I literally look forward to washing my hair which is like a process with how thick it is but before I even finished washing it with my shampoo for the first time I already felt a difference in my hair. I used all of their products in the shower today and my hair is just looking fantastically silky and smooth so I am planning on continuing to use Function of Beauty after this video collaboration with them but I would definitely recommend checking them out if you are looking for a more personalized hair care experience. Function of Beauty also has a really strong brand message about sustainability which is something that's important to me and I know to many of you as well. They currently use 100% recyclable materials for their shipping and for their bottles they also use post-consumer recycled or PCR plastics which are much better for the environment as they reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce the amount of plastics that end up in landfills. I obviously am really pleased with my first experience with Function of Beauty and if you are interested in trying them out for yourself, you can get 20% off your first order using the link in the description. You taking advantage of offers like this that actually interest you directly helps support my channel and I'm really grateful for all of your support. All right, we are diving in to the books. I gotta be honest, I was supposed to start filming an hour ago and this wine is very warm. The first book I recently read is Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng. This book is set in an affluent suburban neighborhood in the 90s and it follows a single mom and her daughter who moved to this neighborhood right as there is a custody battle over a Chinese American baby that is kind of shaking the community and people are all are on really opposing sides. I'd been wanting to read Little Fires Everywhere for a really long time and I'm super glad I did because I ended up loving it and giving it four out of five stars. I actually picked this one up on audio through my local library on their Libby app so I definitely recommend the audio version. The writing was fabulous. Celeste Ng definitely has a talent for words and I am super compelled to pick up more of her works in the future now. I especially think that the omniscient narrator worked really well for the story as we were kind of jumping around and seeing the story from very different perspectives. It is a pretty slow paced book and it is character driven in nature, but it is so compelling that I feel like it's a type of book you speed through because you just don't want to put it down. And also the characters in this story feel so authentic and real and it just explores some very interesting and unique relationship dynamics between siblings and parents and friends and lovers and people of different social classes and different racial groups. There's a ton of moral complexities proposed in the stories and it really makes it difficult for you to fully agree with one character and so I love books that really make me challenge my morals and my personal way of thinking. It's a really well constructed story with great plot twists 
gifts that are approached in like a subtle surprising way it was just an all-around joy to read and I cannot wait to read from more of Celestine in the future the next book I recently read is The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue by V.E. Schwab I got an early copy of this book from a publisher event like right before COVID hit and I'm really grateful I did because this book does not come out until October of this year and the reason I don't have my copy right now is because I lent it to my sister and she is currently reading and loving it too. If you have not heard of The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, it follows a woman who is living in like 1700s France and she ends up making a deal with a devil in order to escape an arranged marriage and live a life of freedom. So the catch is that Addie becomes immortal and she can never die, but anyone who meets her will forget her the second that she leaves their eyesight. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue was one of the most awe-inspiring masterpieces I have ever read. <laughs> it is like a standout book among all others. It is a top favorite of the year. It is a top favorite of all time. I have gushed about the writing of Addie LaRue many times. Victoria Schwab just has this beautiful poetic prose and reading throughout the story there were just like countless lines that I saved for later because just like that sentence and that message was so beautiful and profound that I didn't want to forget it. It's about being trapped and finding freedom, experiencing pain, using your voice, and just yearning to really be seen by others. I was surprised to find that Henry, the love interest in this novel, actually has his own perspective. I thought it was totally told from Addie's POV, but I thought it added a lot of depth to the novel by having these two individual narratives, but having it focus more on Addie because she's lived much longer. And just all the parallels between them are so brilliant with Addie being the woman who is always forgotten and Henry being the person who gets attention for all the wrong reasons. I do wish that the dual perspectives were a little bit more balanced because it was very heavily focused on Addie in the beginning and then Henry comes in and it's very focused on Henry. So that's just a big pet peeve of mine when it comes to multiple perspectives. I want to read from each character equally. And also the mystical and supernatural aspects of this world were just so carefully curated and I can't express what it made me think of but it felt like this sort of old type of magic that had been really established despite being this one new individual story. Ooh, that was deep. I don't know where that came from. That was not in my notes. <laughs> the Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is truly a one-of-a-kind book. I could not recommend it enough. It is an adult novel, but I feel like it has appeal to YA readers despite having some of these more mature themes to be aware of but it was just stunning. I can't stop thinking about it enough and I just am excited for it to be released into the world and for you to all experience the story of Addie too. The next book I've recently read is City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert who is the highly acclaimed author of Eat, Pray, Love, but this is actually a historical fiction novel set in the 1940s. It follows a rich young woman named Vivian who is kicked out of college and forced to go live with her aunt who lives in New York City and runs a small playhouse. The story is told in a letter to a woman named Angela when Vivian is 95 years old and it is her detailing the story of what her life was like when she first moved to New York and the truth of the scandal that she was involved with that kind of upended her life and transformed her forever. I had been really drawn to this book by the cover and also that synopsis gave me a lot of Evelyn Hugo vibes and as someone who is a huge Evelyn Hugo fan and has read City of Girls, I will say there are some elements and aspects, like I use the word vibes very specifically, that feel similar to Evelyn Hugo but it is a completely different story so you have to keep that in mind going in if you're making a connection between the two. It was fun! Fun and free and reckless and glamorous in the first half. There was just so much excitement and so many quirky characters to explore. And then halfway through the book, the course of the novel kind of changes and I unfortunately just did not like the direction that it went in. The word that I've kind of been using to describe the second half of this book is domestic. And that is very different from the start of the story and how it's prompted as being this young woman who goes into this life of the New York City actor nightlife and is dancing with showgirls and sleeping with men. And so it was all very exciting 
and then it was like all very low-key. The book explores a lot of really important themes with it taking place during World War II. I find a lot of the fiction I've read during that time period doesn't actually take place in the United States so it's really interesting to read from the perspective of like what was going on in like my city around that time. It has a super strong message about feminism, especially the beauty of friendship between women, but also the many different and mixed relationships and experiences that women can have to one another. It is also really sex positive. There is a lot of sex in this book and a lot of different types of sex, and so if that is something that turns you off in reading, you should not read this book, but I love books that are super sex positive, so that was super super fun to read about. I want to make it clear that it's not just that there's like a lot of sex in the book. There is. But what's more important is that it's really a commentary on human sexuality, but specifically women's sexuality. It's about a woman's right to own her sexuality and embrace it and critiquing the systems of society that oppress that. The second half just like lost all the charm and appeal that came from the first half and while it explored a lot of these really important themes that I loved and were really well done, it just did not hold up to where the story started. So I ended up giving it three and a half stars but like literally if it had continued on the same path as the first half this would be a five star like new favorite for me. So I kind of still consider it in the realm of my favorites. It's a weird experience. I have like really really good feelings attached to this book and some not so good ones. But overall, I think I did really enjoy it. Okay, maybe not really at some points, but I did enjoy it. The next book I recently read was How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi, and I actually listened to this on audio through the Penguin Volumes app, and it is narrated by the author himself. How to Be an Anti-Racist is a nonfiction work that is balanced between looking at racism from a macro level and societal level, through history and research, but also through anecdotes and like being part memoir from the author's experiences growing up as a black boy into a black man. Honestly, from the moment I started this book, I really regretted picking it up on audio, not because the audiobook is not good, because Ibram X. Kendi is a great narrator, he put so much power and emotion into his voice, and I really enjoyed hearing the story through his voice. But I immediately wanted to highlight everything in this book. It is just absolutely brilliant and full of so many quotes that I know I want to go back to in the future, so I'm 100% going to be rereading this one at some point, and like, marking it up and writing notes and just like putting in everything I can about this book. This book is for people who want to go a step beyond just acknowledging what racism is and that it exists. It is for people who are willing to take individual and personal responsibility for how they have contributed to racism, how they have internalized it, and taking direct action in order to be anti-racist. I'm really, really glad I read How to Be an Anti-Racist. I'm not sure if I said it before, but I gave this book five out of five stars because it just feels like such a wonderful, comprehensible, and like attainable and consumable message about anti-racism for the common public. I won't lie, it's a dense read, it took me a long time to get through, and I'm not someone who reads a ton of nonfiction, but I'm really grateful that I did read it, and I feel like I learned so much from the experience, and I really retained the information that I read. I really appreciated how it looks at racism through a totally intersectional lens, examining the many different facets that contribute to it, like systemic racism, behavioral racism, cultural racism, gendered racism, sexual orientation racism, racism and class, racism and science, racism and power. I do not have the words to explain why each of those individual topics are central to the discussion about racism, but if you're somebody who is interested in deconstructing more of your biases and really putting in the uncomfortable work it takes to be anti-racist, Ibram Max Kendi has outlined it in this guide for you and I'd really recommend picking it up. Next up on my list of recent reads is Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. It follows two girls, one living in New York, one living in the Dominican Republic, who have never spoken and never met but they are brought together when they find out that their father has died on a flight and they discover that they are long lost sisters who never knew about each other. 
Now I am a hardcore Elizabeth Acevedo stan, pretty much like everyone I meet who reads any of her books. I feel like she just has this like infectious love that comes with her books that it's impossible not to like. Clap When You Land is told through free verse, which if you don't know that terminology, it essentially means the story is told through poetry. I have never considered myself to be a big fan of poetry, but in the last year or so I have read so many novels written in verse that have just really touched me and I've started to find a great appreciation for them and that has really started with Elizabeth Acevedo. Her choice of language is just stunning and I feel like she has this keen talent of finding ways to describe things that we may experience or observe in words that like no one else could possibly think of but that truly capture all of the feelings and emotions that come with it. I loved both of the main characters in this story. They come from two entirely different lives. They have very different reactions to this like once in a lifetime scenario that they are thrown into and I really loved watching them grow individually and as sisters throughout the story. It explores a lot of important themes like the persistence of rape culture, privilege and class differences, family secrets and dynamics, and also one of the main characters is queer so we have an, some exploration of identity in there as well. The three words I would use to describe this book are intense, moving, and emotional. This book just made me feel a lot of things in a really profound way and I'm so grateful that I read it. I absolutely loved it. It gets five out of five stars. It was one of my most anticipated reads of the year and and I think I'm just realizing now how satisfying this book was. Like I feel it has been quite a long time if like a book has ever managed to really like fulfill my expectations exactly as I had them. So that's really cool to realize that like Clap When You Land is just exactly the story I wanted and the one that I got. So I would definitely recommend picking it up if you have not already. The next book I recently read is Long Way Down by Jason Reynolds. Now I totally picked this book up on a whim. I was in bed one morning, I like couldn't get back to sleep and it was really early. So I kind of just wanted to read in bed. I think I just wasn't feeling like reading my physical book. So I went through my Libby app again, which is connected to my local library. So I get to listen to a ton of audiobooks and read ebooks totally free. So I was just scrolling what my library had available for ebooks for me to start like right then and there. And I knew I wanted something short, which led me to looking for books in verse and I found Long Way Down. Now this book is absolutely fascinating because it takes place in the span of one minute. I honestly did not even know it was only supposed to be a minute long while I was reading. That's just a really interesting fact I found out later. Of course to have a story take place only in 60 seconds you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a little bit, your understanding of reality and your conception of time, but Jason Reynolds did it in a really wonderful and well executed way. The main focus on this story is how violence and toxic masculinity influences the lives of young black boys and black men. It's about the different lessons we internalize from those around us and what we choose to do with those lessons. I'm personally the type of reader that loves a really expansive long story so the limitations from the shortness of this one definitely left a bit to be desired for me and also I felt that the ending was really abrupt like I get that that's kind of the point but it gives me no closure and it's like you got me all emotional and thinking about these serious issues and scenarios and all these feelings and then you just leave me out to dry. It was a really great read. I gave it four out of five stars. And if you have not picked this one up yet, I definitely recommend. It is a super fast read. I literally finished it in 35 minutes. So it's a good one if you're looking for something quick, but also thought provoking. Next up on my recent reads is a pretty polarizing new release with a lot of mixed reviews and opinions. And that is The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins, which is the new prequel to the Hunger Games series following a young President Snow. I was a big Hunger Games fan back in the day and I was really excited when the prequel was released and despite all of those mixed pre-reviews and then reviews that were mixed that did come out, I was still looking forward to reading it. This is definitely one of those books that I thoroughly enjoyed my time reading because of the nostalgia factor, but it doesn't really stand up on its own. It was really fascinating to read about the differences that come in the 70 years between the original Hunger Games trilogy and this prequel. 
In the OG trilogy, the tributes are paraded around and adored by the capital citizens, but in this installment, they are treated like the prisons of the country that they truly are. My main thought, feeling, or takeaway from the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was that I just loved being back in the world of the Hunger Games and experiencing a new story in that world. Suzanne Collins was able to jump right back into the atmosphere and the structure of the world that she created, and that is my favorite thing to experience when reading these later released sequels or prequels so on that front I was very satisfied I also did a rewatch of all the Hunger Games movies after finishing or actually kind of like while I was reading the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes so I'm really grateful it gave me that because that was super fun but unfortunately every aspect of this book is kind of just a left down to the original Hunger Games the actual Hunger Games, like the event, is significantly less interesting than the other two that we have read about because there is none of the technology, there's no training for the tributes, there's less tributes in the arena and they're doing less stuff so there's less action and really like the, to top it all off is just the fact that we are experiencing the Hunger Games through the eyes of a spectator because Coriolanus is a mentor and not a tribute. Certain plot points in the story felt unrealistic to me and I really tried to be reasonable with the story and I was like it makes sense because the capital was more cruel so they didn't have as many boundaries and like the stuff that they were doing could be more outlandish and they wouldn't get in trouble for it but even then I was like still not convinced by a lot of the stuff that went down in this book. It just felt like consistently throughout the whole story poor decisions were made that were weaker than the original construction of the story and that just is always not going to fare well to a comparison to the original series. The characters really weren't all that strong, especially Coriolanus who is the protagonist who is just like very uncompelling to read about. And especially the character relationships felt particularly forced to me. I thought the idea of the romance was interesting, like the mentor falling in love with the tribute who was meant to go die in the arena, but it was so insta-lovey and it's a shame because the characters Coriolanus and Lucy Gray actually had a lot of great organic chemistry in my opinion but they got so intense so quickly and it was just a disappointment that didn't feel real. But another good point in my eyes is that in contrast to what many people assumed this book was trying to do, it really challenged the narrative that evil white men are just victims of society. You don't empathize with Coriolanus, you don't like him, you get an explanation for what his past was like, but it doesn't make you feel any differently about him. That, in my opinion, is what Suzanne Collins always sought out to do, and I think she accomplished it really well. It's definitely on the reader to read this one from that critical mindset, but I think Suzanne Collins did everything she needed to do to make that really easy for readers to see. So there unfortunately were a lot of downsides to this book and a lot of things I'm critical of, but the atmosphere and just like the aspects of being back in this world were really powerful enough for me to still really enjoy the story and look back on it pretty fondly. So I think if you were a massive Hunger Games back in the day, you do still have the potential to enjoy it, but I think you really need to go into it with the mindset that like it is not comparable to the original Hunger Games and you are kind of going to be disappointed in a lot of those aspects. I think I forgot to mention I also gave this one 3 out of 5 stars because again, I really did enjoy my time reading it and I'm glad I did, I have fond memories of it, but overall, objectively, it's just not a great written book. The next book I recently read is I'm Thinking of Ending Things by Ian Reid. I was recommended this book by my friends Elias and Monica who were just gushing about it in our group chat saying it was super twisted and mind-blowing. So as someone who trusts a lot of their thriller recommendations, I wanted to give it a chance. All they said about it was it follows a woman who is on a short road trip with a new boyfriend that she has been seeing to meet his parents and on the ride there she is thinking about breaking up with him. I really wanted to like this book. I thought this book had a lot of elements that I could have liked. Unfortunately, I did not really like it at all. I think I'm gonna give it like one and a half stars because there is very few things I liked about this book and that's unfortunate because I wanted to like it. It's positives. It is an interesting surrealist and existential journey. That's it. I'm kidding. It also really captures an atmosphere that makes you feel 
loneliness and isolation, which is all well done. It's chilly, unsettling, creepy, and bizarre. It's like a book that's kind of gonna get into your mind and you're not gonna know what you're reading, but you're gonna be really uncomfortable about it. And at the height of this story and the highest point for me, I was like genuinely terrified imagining myself in the main character's shoes and like thinking about what I would do in her scenario. And that was like the best part of the book for me because I could really relate to it. It is a very slow paced book, one that you should read very carefully, but it has this like annoying intrigue to it where you can't put it down even if you aren't really enjoying yourself like myself. So there's all this build up, all this stuff is making sense to me, and then we get to the big plot twist and the end of the story. And I have never been so confused in my goddamn life while reading a book. I have read hundreds and hundreds of books over the last like seven years, and I have never been so confused. <laughs> So I go online and I read some discussion posts, I find out what it's really supposed to mean and what the general interpretation of the story is, and unfortunately the ending is really one of my like least favorite plot twist tropes ever. I just felt very disconnected from the story the entire time. Nothing makes sense until the ending, where like me, you might not even understand the ending that's supposed to make sense of everything. But okay, it's meaningless until you really know what it means, that's all fine and clever. But the problem is, I didn't enjoy my time reading this story, so if I also don't feel that there's any payoff in the end, did you really win with the execution there? Like, I know the ending now, and I feel even more unsatisfied. Clearly, I just missed the hype on this one, and it wasn't meant for me, that's totally okay. But Netflix also recently released a film adaptation of I'm Thinking of Ending Things, so you can watch it if you'd like. But unfortunately, I liked the film even less. <laughs> I just feel like a part of the film industry believes that the more abstract a story is, the better it is, and the more quality, and the more impressive it is, and I just don't personally agree with that at all. It was a shame. I didn't like it. I really hope you liked it more than myself. <laughs> and the final book I recently read and am talking about in this video is Shout by Lori Hals Anderson. So this is a memoir from the incredibly prolific writer Lori Hals Anderson, who you might know from some of her very popular releases like Winter Girls, Catalyst, The Impossible Knife of Memory, and especially relevant to today's book, Speak. Now you definitely don't have to read Speak in order to read Shout, even though it is by the same author because this is like a memoir about her life, but I do think it is important to have some kind of understanding of the impact that Speak has had as one of the most famous novels about sexual assault of all time, and really like understand what that would mean to a survivor of sexual assault writing this book. They're two completely individual stories, but Speak is referenced a lot in Shout, more than I was expecting, so if you have the time and are interested, I do think it's worth reading beforehand, you just don't have to. Now, I have some like weird mixed feelings on Shout. I kind of don't really know how to fully express the extent of how I feel about it, but ultimately it was a really good book and I gave it three out of five stars. Lori Halls Anderson has a really beautiful prose and lyrical word choice. I don't think I've read anything from her with poetry before, but I thought they were all beautifully written, and if you're someone who doesn't like poetry, it's one of those books written in verse that doesn't feel like poetry, so I think it's still worth the read. But the purpose of Shout is really to be a story for survivors of sexual assault, a place where they can find comfort, healing, validation, and empowerment. I really appreciate how this book is truly unapologetic on its stance about how society treats women and how that is unacceptable. Shout is an apt title because this book is really loud. This book is fired up, it is full of anger, and I really love seeing that because traditionally throughout history, women have been silenced for being angry and they have not been allowed to show this very valid emotion. So I love seeing women express that, especially through writing. I think I'm realizing that a good way to describe the way I feel about this book is that I keep feeling like this book didn't have these things that I like wanted from it, but it did, but I still feel like it didn't. I was looking for storytelling and a narrative and the second half of this book is really like a lot of essays 
essays that are really good and powerful but just not what I was looking to read I guess. Shout deals with other topics in addition to sexual assault. It really focuses on substance abuse and family abuse but it has some like lighter more unique and interesting aspects as I had no idea that Lori Hals Anderson studied abroad in Denmark for like a year and she has a real interest in learning languages which was super cool to read about. If you're someone who is also invested in issues related to sexual abuse and sexual assault, I definitely think this is one you should put on your list, but also something about this book just didn't click for me. So that really concludes this episode of Recent Reads. Again, I have like another full video's worth of books that I have recently completed to film. I just wanted to separate them into two videos so they wouldn't be too long. If you are excited to read any of the books I talked about in today's video or if you have, I would love to hear your thoughts on them. And don't forget to check out Function of Beauty and get your first order for 20% off using the link in my description. But that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you soon for a new one. Bye!